My presentation is about entropy and the measurement of cognitive load. I will, just, I will briefly describe uh, two uh, entropy-based metrics that theoretically can quantify cognitive load. And in terms of practice, we might approximate these values through empirical data. So I will also show uh, how these two metrics differ from each other in terms of predicting effort uh, based on the empirical data. This is part of a larger project, which looks at the lexical and structural ambiguity in translation and post-editing, um, aiming to track the linguistic variables on the effort of translating and post-editing, but more importantly, also to, to conceptually understand the cognitive processes underlying the observed behavior. In this presentation, I'm going to focus on a very small part of it, which is on the lexical level, and review some of the theoretical assumptions concerning the, the assumed mental states, which lay the foundation of using entropy to describe uh, the process of lexical choice. And then I will mainly talk about two perspectives, which, are, um, which might theoretically quantify uh, cognitive load. One is the shift of resource allocation, and the other is reduction of entropy, which is briefly touched upon in um, a, a, a paper last year. Um, I will try to argue that the shift of resource allocation is equivalent to surprisal and can be approximated through empirical data by what we call ITRA in the Crete database. And the other one, which is reduction of entropy, can perhaps be approximated by uh, HTRA in the data set. Now, these are conceptual, and in the empirical part, I will compare these two metrics in terms of their prediction of effort. So that's the structure of the presentation. But to put it in some somewhat of a larger context, uh, we might look at that uh, in view of the predictive turn. When translation studies was argued as an independent academic discipline in its own right, it has been argued that there are two main objectives for this discipline. One, to describe the phenomena of translations and translating as they manifest themselves in our world of experience. And two, to establish general principles by means of which these observed phenomena can be explained and predicted. So that has inspired a lot of research in descriptive translation studies, uh, but in recent years, because of many aspects of technological and methodological development, uh, we're beginning to explain and predict translation, uh, both in terms of products and process, uh, with relatively more dependable uh, means. Uh, so in 2019, uh, the, the authors of this paper said that, that adapting predictive methods and models constitutes a new paradigm in translation studies, which they call the predictive turn. Uh, this is largely the result of two aspects. Uh, the, uh, the, the first one is the machine learning approach to translation, typically represented by neural machine translation systems. And we, on the other hand, from the process aspect of it, we also have uh, rigorous statistical means and computational analyses to model the human translation process so that the, uh, these models can be less speculative and the uh, translator, translator strategies, the translation patterns and cognitive effort can be measurable and quantifiable. It is largely possible to make falsifiable and specific predictions regarding the product and process of translation. In view of these uh, this predictive turn. Um, we have naturally seen uh, a lot of studies that, um, uh, st that analyze the specific features of the text that can predict the efficiency and cognitive effort of translation and uh, different kinds of uh, other kinds of uh, modes of translation production. One of that is the number of translation alternatives for a particular source text items. And empirical studies have shown that the I key span or the time interval between the first fixation on the word and the start of production for each translation can be predicted by the number of translational alternatives. Uh, this is also consistent to studies of ambiguity using decontextualized single words. And theoretically, in psycholinguistics, there seems to be a general consensus that bilinguals activate both of their languages when they're working on either one. And when it comes to ambiguity, multiple meanings are activated simultaneously. Um, we can, we can also conceptualize this uh, when we look at the bilingual process. So upon encounter of the 
source text item, multiple target text items are activated. And this is followed by a selection process in which these activated items come into competition uh, for selection. And another typical uh, feature of the text, uh, which is used to predict effort, is the word translation entropy, abbreviated as HTRA. Uh, mathematically, it, mod it represents the degree of uncertainty in the translation choice, and has been considered a better measure of the variation of the translation alternatives than simply counting how many alternatives there are. Uh, and from a cognitive perspective, it represents the co-activated translation options for uh, particular source text items. The mathematical uh, definition of entropy models the, uh, represents the distribution of probabilities. So if we have uh, a probability for each item corresponding to uh, each target text item corresponding to a particular source text item, then we would end up with a distribution of different items corresponding to this source text token. Right? And if these probabilities are distributed evenly, uh, the corresponding entropy value would be very high. Uh, if, on the other hand, these probabilities are concentrated on very few items, then the entropy would be very low. So that's the general idea of this mathematical uh, uh, equation for, uh, for the measure. Now, empirical studies have shown significant impact of word translation entropy on different measures of effort. Uh, uh, including these fixation-based um, effort uh, from eye movement data. In very short terms, uh, HTRA seems to predict effort. So a higher HTRA value uh, results in uh, more effort and is therefore uh, very often considered a, a very diffi a, a, a relatively difficult uh, to translate for that source text token. For many of such studies, the word translation entropy is generally considered a feature of the product, a way of counting the translation equivalence, um, rather than as a description of the mental states. So it's a measure of the product and not a, a representation of the specific aspects of the mental states during the process of translating, nor is it considered a, a, uh, a description of the transition between one mental state to another. However, there is an exception here, uh, which is the systems theory perspective. Uh, from that perspective, the, the, the translation process is considered a hierarchy of interacting word and phrase translation systems, which organize and integrate as dissipative structures. Entropy here is defined as the internal disorder of the system, and the expenditure of effort, where this effort is described as average energy, that expenditure decreases the internal disorder, which in other words, decreases the entropy of the system. The definition there is clearly from a systems perspective, a systems theory perspective. Uh, another paper adopts a slightly different perspective, focusing more on the probabilistic nature of the concept of entropy. And the dynamic change of probability distribution, as I said, mathematically, it, it represents this distribution. So it, it, it analyzes the change of the, this distribution uh, uh, in the mental states uh, during the process. Uh, it also focuses on the uncertainty of choice and the cognitive resource allocation in the activation, suppression, competition, and selection of candidates when multiple options are available. In addition to these conceptual analyses, uh, the behavioral manifestations of these uh, uh, of the process uh, is also analyzed in that. That analysis um, is based on the assumption of non-selective co-activation of both the source and the target text, which I mentioned earlier. And upon encounter of a particular source text item, multiple TT items uh, are activated subliminally, and the translators are, are assumed to engage in an activation pattern where the activated items receive different degrees of priority for resource allocation. And, they, and, and this allocation would be gradually changed. So. Uh, when the items are activated, the translators will try to select one from these multiple uh, poss possible uh, choices. Uh, and as the translator proposes and, evalu uh, and evaluates these solutions, um, a change of probability distribution would occur, uh, which comes with a change of resource allocation. 
So this distribution would be, this activation pattern would be dynamically updated, which comes with continual shift of cognitive resource allocation, and this results in expenditure of effort as well as entropy reduction. From that perspective, it will accordingly uh, be two perspectives which can quantify the cognitive load in this process. One has to do with the shift of resource allocation or the size of this shift, and another is entropy reduction. So if we have the initial mental state of activation with a higher level of entropy and the gradual change of distribution which reduces the entropy until the final state, we can either have the difference between these two entropy values or we can calculate the size of resource allocation which uh, can be represented by relative entropy and I'll come back to that later on. Now in very short terms we have two ways of quantification theoretically. One is uh, resource one has to do with the resource allocation and another is a uh, entropy value between two mental states. As I said, I will argue that, that this equals the, uh, at the surprisal of the item which is eventually selected and approximated by ITRA, whereas the reduction of entropy can be approximated by ITRA. But before doing so, uh, I will review briefly the concept of surprisal and how it describes cognitive load in psycholinguistics. The surprisal, uh, defined very simply math, uh, in, in terms of mathematics, is just the negative logarithm of probability. So it's very simple. But in psycholinguistics, it has, it has been used as a very useful quantification for cognitive load. Because sentence comprehension, from that perspective, sentence comprehension is a step-by-step -step disconfirmation of possible phrase structural analyses. And cognitive load, can be interpreted as the combined difficulty of discon disconfirming all these disconfirmable structures. Uh, in expectation-based models of sentence processing, the, the processing difficulty or measurable disruption arises from a sufficiently unexpected input, which causes a shift in, resource resource, uh, in cognitive resource allocation to various alternatives in the face of uncertainty. And as Levy argues, the size of this shift would be represented by the change of probability distribution before and after this work uh, is processed. Now, that's the size of the shift induced by a particular word. Mathematically, that would be the relative entropy, or uh, sometimes also called kubak leibler divergence. And to Levy, this is the re-ranking cost in incremental disambiguation. Now, the, all these analyses are monolingual and uh, largely uh, has to do with structural disambiguation. I'll try to argue that this relative entropy, if we do the mathematics, would be equal to the surprisal of the item eventually uh, chosen. So quantifying cognitive load, we have shift of resource allocation, which uh, if we adopt the formulation in Levy, uh, would be represented by relative entropy and equal to surprisal and then approximated by ITRA. So on the other hand, the reduction of entropy would be uh, ITRA. So that's the ITRA there. If we have PX representing the initial distribution of activation uh, and the QX is the final selection stage. And if we assume that there are N items in the mental lexicon, uh, among which it is word W that is selected eventually, then we can calculate the relative entropy and the absolute difference of entropy values between these two distributions when PX and QX. So if we do the mathematics, then the relative entropy here would be uh, divide, well, if we add from one to N and take out the W and the rest, of the sum, then eventually we end up with uh, this part and then to another two parts. Uh, and if we do further mathematics, we would find that this equals zero and that equals zero. So the Kubak library divergence would be equal to simply the negative logarithm of W. And this means the relative entropy is equal to surprisal. Right? And, and in the data, it would be approximated by ITRA. Uh, from, so in the same manner, if we, get the decrease of entropy value between these two mental states, we get H0 and H1, where H1 is, uh, is zero, then the H0 minus H1 is simply the entropy value there uh, for the initial distribution. So I have 
um, mentioned two perspectives. One is shift of resource allocation, which uh, measured by relative entropy would be equal to surprisal of the chosen item. And the red reduce of entropy value is the absolute difference of these two values uh, between the mental states. And that's the entropy generalizing all, over all alternative choices. Both can be approximated by text through corpus-based means. And, the, and in this regard, there will be two metrics that are very, very interesting here and worthy of further discussion. One is ITRA and, and another is HTRA. So we have two, these two. Uh, in terms of the translation product, IHTRA generalizes over all translations, where, while ITRA indicates the unpredictability of a specific item. And that item, uh, most of the time, would be uh, the one that appears in the product. From a process perspective, in relation to the mental states of initial activation and final selection, ITRA represents the re reduction of entropy, whereas ITRA, uh, ITRA is the size of shift in the resource allocation. In terms of their mathematical expression, uh, ITRA is the initial PX distribution, whereas ITRA is the surprisal of the final choice, right? And, and this one is the absolute difference uh, between the two mental states, whereas that one is the relative entropy of the final state with respect to the initial uh, mental state. Now, they have different perspectives, right? And, and there are a lot of differences there. A question, a very interesting question there, which follows is that which one is a better predictor if we look at the data from an empirical perspective? So in terms of predicting effort, I looked at the Crete database in the multi-link data set uh, and included 500 experimental sessions. Um, the effort was measured by both production time and reading time, and the production time is represented by the duration of TT production for ST token. So it's at the token level. And the reading time uh, looks at the, both the early measures and late measures on the eye movement in the database. I did some multiple regression analysis. So if we add ITRA into the regression model uh, and then add ITRA and compare the base model with the, with the full model, we might, uh, this might shed light on how ITRA explain additional variance in uh, production time and reading time. Results is also interesting. Now, uh, the, for the production time, the base models for both ITRA and HTRA are significant. And ITRA explained a, a, a more percentage of the variance in production time. For the full models where both ITRA and HTRA are added, this is also significant. But what's more interesting there is that ITRA in the full model, it's more than three times as a, strong predict, a stronger predictor than ITRA. If we compare the base models and the full, uh, full models, we see that with ITRA controlled, no additional variance was explained by ITRA. Uh, in contrast, after controlling ITRA, ITRA explained an additional 2% of the variance, and that difference is um, statistically significant. So while controlling for the other variable, ITRA made an additional contribution to explaining the variance in production time whereas HTRA did not. This seems to lend support for the uh, perspective of resource allocation shift, you know, rather than reduction of entropy. However, if we look at the reading time, we see something very different. So for the ST reading time, all impacts in all models were significant for all measures of ST reading time. Um, and for both early and late measures, HTRA seem to be a stronger predictor than ITRA. This is the, you know, the, 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 the opposite from uh, the previous result on production time. For early measures, HTRA explained an additional 1% of the variance only in one of these measures. And for late measures, no additional variance was explained by either variable. Now, this is very different from production time, right? In terms of TT reading, uh, we don't see much of a difference between the two, although all predictions are significant here. So if we compare the beta value here, we don't see a large difference. In conclusion, uh, we have looked at two ways of quantifying cognitive load, shift of resource allocation and reduction of entropy. And at the conceptual level, I have tried to argue that HTRA approximates the reduction of entropy in the mental state, uh, while ITRA approximates the size of shift in cognitive resource allocation.
uh, hopefully I have provided some theoretical justifications for both ITRA and HTRA as potential means of quantifying cognitive load. In the empirical analyses, we find that both metrics are significant and strong in terms of predicting effort. Uh, but ITRA has a, is a strong, it seems to be a stronger predictor for word production time. HTRA, on the other hand, seems to be a stronger predictor for ST reading time. And the difference for a prediction of TT reading uh, was found to be relatively small. Uh, I hope that this would contribute to the exploration of, uh, of theoretically justifiable and empirically dependable means of uh, predicting effort and quantifying cognitive load. Thank you. All right, thank you. And now time for questions, comments. Yes, Haruka. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Um, so, well, naively speaking, I feel like it makes sense that ITRA produce a better, um, it, uh, it had a better explanatory power than HTRA because if I understood this correctly, ITRA values are assigned to each target token, whereas HTRA is assigned to one, a, a source text token. But because there are more uh, different values on ITRA, I feel like it just statistically speaking makes sense that ITRA produces um, better result. Am I right in thinking that or what do you think? Well, I think uh, both HTRA and ITRA uh, would involve some aspects of TL, uh, target language, and target language related processing. But the difference is that HTRA would generalize from all these possibilities, but ITRA is just one single item. And I think the difference between these two in terms of uh, the, the cognitive processes is when, um, how early uh, this effect come into play. Um, I would assume that uh, the H tray is closer to the activation, where all of these items uh, receive uh, cognitive resources, where all these items are activated. And there's no clear indication of which one is more likely than others. Right? And that would be uh, better represented by HTRA. Whereas ITRA might be more uh, closer to the selection because it, it, is, it is only from the, uh, the final choice. And I think that might be consistent with these results here. Uh, we find that ITRA uh, is a better predictor for production time, which presumably would have more to do with the selection of these you know, all of these processes that might happen later in language transfer. And for the ST reading time, which, you know, the, it, it is more, which involves more of the early processes, we, we, we see that ASHRA uh, seem to be a, a much stronger predictor. So I would say that um, probably the difference between these two is that ITRA uh, is slightly later, whereas mm -hmm. the impact of ASHRA uh, is, exerted very early on. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I have one more question. So um, when I was working on my dissertation, I was really interested. I tried to basically predict cognitive effort using source text, uh, target text, and translator characteristics, kind of like what you did here. But when I was working on the project, I was wondering why we uh, translation scholars have used many different measures or indicators of cognitive effort, like uh, production time is one, first fixation duration is one, uh, total reading time is one, right? Um, based on, my question is based on your research, do you think we are measuring different maybe aspect of cognitive load when we use different majors or indicators of cognitive load or are we essentially looking at the same thing i mean these measures of uh, uh i mean you so, know, these measures right right so you found for example that uh itra 
ITRA is a better predictor for duration, right? Like, for, uh, yeah, production time. Right, production yeah. duration, right? Yeah, for, for the token, at the token. Yes, level. exactly. Yes. yes. So if you try to predict, for example, total reading time using ITRA or HTRA, are we looking at the same thing? I would say no. no. Uh, you're talking about this reading time, right? You're right. Uh, and it will be either the source or the target, right? It will be right, total reading right. time, S or T, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think, um, th well, th th of course, there's a difference between the early and late measures of eye movement, mm -hmm. right? First fixation and first pass fixation would be different from the total reading time. Right. But I think uh, if we're looking at the reading, we might, um, we, we might not include every part of this process. And I would say that the production time uh, may, may be, you know, it, 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 it incorporates more of the process than simply the reading. That's what I, what I assume, but... Like holistic right. like, translation process. Right, okay. right, right. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I would say that the, uh, for the production time, the, oops, the duration of TT production for this token is the, uh, it, 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 well, the, the, this might be a, a better representation of the, of, of the entire process for this token, I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we don't have any more questions. Uh, thank you again, Yushan. Thank you.